Hello, and welcome back to Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion. This week, we welcome Laura Fackrell, geochemist at the University of Georgia, to the show. We will be discussing her work developing soil for farms on Mars, capable of growing crops to feed interplanetary colonists. We're also going to journey out beyond our solar system, where Voyager 2 hears from NASA for the first time in months. We examine a tiny asteroid traveling through space along with Mars that is a near-perfect geological match for our moon. Finally, we'll explore the solar system from our own backyards as all seven planets visible in the sky can be seen this week from most places on Earth. For the first time since March, NASA sent a signal to the Voyager 2 spacecraft racing through space just outside our solar system. Because of its position relative to Earth, Voyager can only receive commands from a single radio telescope in the southern hemisphere. This telescope, called Deep Space Station 43, located just outside Canberra, Australia, recently underwent eight months of upgrades, preventing NASA from communicating with the robotic explorer. On October 29th, NASA sent commands to the craft which were successfully received, and the 43-year-old Voyager 2 signaled back that it is in fine health. The asteroid 101-429 is a Trojan asteroid orbiting along with Mars in its journey around the Sun. A new study shows the chemistry of this body is nearly identical to the Moon. This makes it unlike any of the other Trojan asteroids gravitationally bound to the red planet. Astronomers are uncertain how 101-429 came into being, although it may have once been a fragment of our own planetary companion. Amateur astronomers have a rare treat this week, as all seven planets visible in the sky can be observed over the course of a single night. For early birds, Venus and Mercury are seen in the eastern sky a while before dawn. Venus is exceedingly bright and Mercury is much dimmer, sitting 12 degrees below and 4 degrees to the north or left of its brilliant companion. Meanwhile, Mars shines bright red in the southeastern sky a while after sunset. Using a telescope or binoculars, Uranus can be found 13 degrees above Mars and 20 degrees north or to the left of the red planet. It will appear as a small light blue disk in most telescopes or binoculars. Neptune, dimmer, darker, and harder to find than Uranus, can be found 11 degrees below and 31 degrees south or right of Mars. Finding this planet can present a real challenge for amateur astronomers. One trick when finding objects in the night sky is to hold a fist out at arm's length. This will mark out about 10 degrees. A single index finger held at arm's length covers around 2 degrees side to side. Jupiter and Saturn are hanging in the southwest. Jupiter is far and away the brightest object in this region of the sky, and Saturn shines with a bright yellow hue, just a few degrees above and to the left of the king of the solar system. These planets are all visible with the naked eye, other than Uranus and Neptune, which can be seen with binoculars or an amateur telescope. This week on Astronomy News, the Cosmic Companion, we are joined by Laura Fackrell, geochemist at the University of Georgia, 
discussing her work, Developing Farms for Mars to Feed Interplanetary Colonies. This week on Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion, we're happy to be joined by Laura Fackrell from the University of Georgia. She's done some intriguing work studying how we might turn the topsoil of Mars into material suitable for growing crops. Welcome to the show, Laura. Thanks. Thanks, James. So uh, let's start off at the beginning. Um, Mars, the topsoil of Mars is extremely different from what we find on Earth. Most notably, it has about 25% iron oxide or rust. Uh, can you tell us about some of the challenges that uh, both crops would face in that growing material, as well as some of the challenges that you face trying to get them to grow? <laughs> Um, yeah, so like so, so that was part of it. Um, so the high level salinity, although the salts themselves, the type of salt varies, and so that might be beneficial or not, depending on that. Um, other things we expected were maybe certain toxins, like some perchlorates, which are a type of salt, but they're toxic as well. So that can be a problem. And then also just the actual environment, but kind of consider that that's the engineers, <laughs> they have to solve providing the actual environment, I'm going to solve the, <laughs> or contribute to solving the soil. Um, and those were, those were the things that I was expecting, were like the basic toxins, the fact that it didn't have very many nutrients, and salts. Um, some unexpected things that came up as I've grown them have also been, as in our simulants that we've created, that they, they um, are mineralogically similar and chemically similar, but they also have this crustiness that I didn't necessarily expect. And so the actual, the roots just couldn't penetrate it. And so the plants just had trouble sprouting just because it was like so difficult for them to penetrate the soil. So like a soil strength is one way you could term that. Hmm. That was something unexpected, but that was pretty easily solved by just mixing it with some things. So we've definitely found some solutions, um, but there's also been the current plants. So I'm, we're kind of finishing up the last experiments right now, but the plants, um, there's a lot of things left it's only to be resolved. So that's kind of where we've come to. <laughs> that's great. And so on the, on the flip side of that, what sort mm -hmm. of, are there any advantages to the Martian soil? Or what does it have going for it? Um, it has going for it in the fact that it does provide a medium. And so it has like a place where the roots can um, do that. And it has it going for it that it's already there. So we don't have to bring it with us. Mm -hmm. <laughs> which is actually a really important advantage because there's a very limited amount you can bring with you. Um, and their nutrients are technically there. The nutrients are present on Mars. They've been able to measure every, most, all the major and most of the minor nutrients are at least present. Although some really important ones like nitrogen are likely very low in concentration. So, but that one might be obtainable through um, recycling of other things. That you were, and so that one's a little bit easier to find another solution for. But other than that, the, so the nutrients are at least present. Whether or not they're available, the plants can actually extract them is another question that I think is still, we don't necessarily have a full answer for yet. Yeah. And of course, you know, one of the big questions in, uh, is water. Yeah, that's huge. You know, how, how do we get <laughs> enough water there to, you yeah. know, bring, to, to help these plants grow? Yeah. And there's been a lot of progress with finding water on Mars. Um, they even have what some think are probably fresh water, although what fresh exactly means I think is still um, <laughs> not really defined yet because we don't know. But there are, so there is water there, but how to get to it is going to be a challenge. That's a huge challenge to overcome. All right, all right. And so I imagine you're trying to find ways of um, enhancing the soil without having to bring a whole lot of material yeah, there to do exactly. it with. I mean, for instance, I do gardening as a hobby. Mm -hmm. And I know like some plants love to have perlite in the mm -hmm. soil. And mm -hmm. so, you know, the question I think for it becomes, 
now how much material will you have to bring with you? Yeah. So are you focusing on materials that, uh, or substances that might be easier and have lower mass to bring to Mars? Or are you just trying to get something to grow at this point? <laughs> I think we're somewhere in between the two. <laughs> <laughs> we're still kind of at the phase of still trying to get, to an extent, we're still trying to get things to grow. It depends on which of the simulants we've used. Um, so one thing that I have found successful in trying to help, at least with the, the soil strength, it's just mixing it with some organic matter. And so I've been using what's called coconut core, so that's a pretty common and lightweight thing. But at the same time, that could also represent just general leftover plant material from the trip over or other waste materials that are organic that you can um, process and then mix in. And so it just lightens the soil a little bit. Mm. Mm. And so that's been one, and so that potentially is just that kind of is something that you produce along the way or to some extent could bring with you in a small amount. So that, that one, I think is an advantage. But then even with, and so some of the simulants with that started had, at the beginning at least have decent growth of plants, but then some of the simulants still don't. So depending on what materials you use, you have to be careful what you choose on Mars too. So I think that's, we're still kind of at the phase of can you even get it to grow? Um, but learning a lot in that phase, but also what do we need to bring with us? So, yeah. <laughs> so somewhere between the two. Somewhere between the two. <laughs> All right. <laughs> That's great. And so we have a uh, listener question. Um, okay. Molly would like to know um, how it is that you've developed an artificial Martian soil mm -hmm. and what it is that you use to create this substitute yeah. Mars. <laughs> so what we did is we have a lot more data than we used to about Mars. So we have all sorts of, we have, um, what, we have mineral data from Curiosity, we have Moss Bauer, so like different iron oxides and all sorts of data from the different rovers that have been there, more than we had in the past. So there are other simulants that exist, but they, as we learned more, we've realized that they will have some inaccuracies as far as chemistry and mineralogy. And so we tried to, those, that's what the plant is using, is the chemicals and the minerals. And so we want those to be accurate if you want to simulate agriculture. And so we've taken that data and we um, created recipes of different materials on Mars. <laughs> and included the soil and included a few other materials that you could obtain and mix with the soil as well. And so we made a few different recipes and then we found materials that matched that on earth. So like um, basalt rock or, uh, and so some of them we gathered in the field, some basalts and some clays, and then some things we were able to order in bulk from distributors. And we mixed those according to the recipes and mix with a little bit of some water <laughs> and salts. And there you get a Mars soil. That's fabulous. And um, of course, I think most people watching this show um, mm -hmm. have probably seen The Martian. <laughs> and of course, you know, can imagine, you know, two years, 26 months of, you know, eating potatoes. <laughs> but uh, what sort of crops have you found are most likely to be among those that we first grow on Mars. Mm -hmm. Well, NASA actually does have a pretty set list as far as what they want to be able to grow. Whether or not that's what will succeed, I think is still kind of, that's something we need to look into a little more. But there is a list of things like, for example, things that are often grown on the ISS station include like different types of lettuce and things, and those will be important. But they also, but those don't provide a lot of calories. And so then you do need things like potatoes and, um, soybean and different things that provide some protein and some nutrients. So they have a very balanced list that provides the nutrients, but now it's a matter of how those specific plants respond. So I'm actually growing a type of bean called moth bean, but I've done a few other things. Most of them didn't do very well, and so I kind of focused on the one that I knew would at least do something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But it's called moth bean, and it's very similar in its nutrient content to soybean, but it's a drought tolerant version like um, bean, and so it can handle a little bit more of harshness. And so it can help allow me to look at what's actually happening to the plant. And that can help us, you know, with other plants after that fact. That's fabulous that you mentioned that because, um, you know, as we've talked a little bit about this, but one of the... Uh... Okay. <laughs> Trouble with living next to an Air Force base. <laughs> um, so we talked a little bit about water, and yeah. you know, you know, we find some 
water ice just beneath the surface of Mars. There's reason mm -hmm. to believe that there may be tiny pockets the size of thimbles of salty mm -hmm. water uh, mm -hmm. within the crust of Mars or, you know, a meter or two beneath. Mm -hmm. um, but it seems like water is going to be in an extremely short supply. Yes. So, so are you, so you're looking, are you looking mostly at drought resistant plants? Um, for my part, that's one of the things I considered because you want, I want something that could handle it a little bit more, could, you know, use a little bit less water and still grow well. Um, so that's part of why I chose the one I did, but I haven't focused specifically on the water yet, although that is a, a big question that needs to be answered. I was focused more on the soil specifically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so we are designing, trying to design different types of soil for different types of plants. Then. That's part of the idea. So um, my different mixtures, the different recipes, one of them is just the general soil, but then you have one that has a little bit of clay in it because that can be beneficial to improving the soil's texture. You also have one that has some, that represents, one of the mixtures actually represents the kind of soil you'd want to avoid on Mars. <laughs> <laughs> um, they just, they uh, don't do this sample. <laughs> and this is more of a case in point kind of where I was fairly sure of the reaction the plant was going to have because of the condition, the chemistry of that particular soil is very acidic and has a lot of heavy metals and things. Um, but it was just more of a case in point where just to kind of really hold, tone that in, this is what you want to avoid. <laughs> um, but yeah, and then I have another one that has carbonates in it, which are not as common as we originally thought would be on Mars, but are very important. And is actually very relevant to the next rover, the Perseverance rover that's headed there now, is headed to a region that has carbonates. Um, and those can help with um, decreasing acidity, but they have, uh, you can add, we call liming the soil. So that's a pretty common practice that we do, is lime the soil in earth agriculture. And so that's potentially a material that could be used for that purpose. So I wanted to like use those different materials in that way. Hmm. That's great. And of course, you know, SpaceX has, you know, has a goal of sending a million people to Mars by the year 2050. Uh, with, as far as the soil is concerned, do you think mm -hmm. it could ha that part of feeding all those people could happen? Uh, by 2050? That seems like a really big leap for where we're at right now, <laughs> from what I've seen. Um, some of the early experiments and using some of the older simulants, they were able to grow things fairly successfully, although not completely, um, but they were able to get some good growth. But some of the more accurate simulants, and mine study is not the only one. There's another study I saw recently that did, it had a similar simulant that also found, is some finding similar things, is that it's not growing as well as those initial experiments may have. And so there's a lot more that we need to answer before we can successfully do agriculture on Mars. And it will probably involve hydroponics and soil. Like it'll involve a combination of whatever works. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, um, but I think a, a more realistic number would be something more like McMurdo Station in Antarctica, where you could support like kind of a rotating um, group of people around, which I think is around a thousand at its peak is what it usually helps. But having a million people on Mars by the year 2050 is, I don't think it's very realistic. All right, all right. Um, <laughs> and so, of course, you know, living, mm -hmm. in, living in Arizona, I have to ask this question. Uh, <laughs> what, have you been able to take any lessons or learn anything from Biosphere 2? Mm -hmm. I actually have looked, I haven't used some of what they have directly, but I have, um, one of the things that's interesting there is just the closed environment in general. So my growth room is not a completely closed environment, um, but that will be a big thing is like how to actually create that completely closed environment. There's a lot of questions there and how do you cycle, recycle those things efficiently. So there's a lot of concerns there. I think I remember one of the experiments I looked at, they actually had problems where they had a fungal infection come into some plants. Right, yeah. That be a big problem. And, and so like, the microbes that you bring with you, not the unintentional ones. <laughs> like we have to remember those things and like be prepared for that kind of thing. So I think that's a big, an important question. Right. And speaking of microbes, you, you, your paper showed that you um, mm -hmm. used a lot of beneficial yeah. microbes. Can you talk about some of those and the yeah. advantages they provide? 
So um, I'm the plant I'm growing is a legume, and so the legumes are well known, like soybean and different um, plants that have the like peanuts. Another one, and so those are plants that have a very well known, a long study of a relationship with of specific strains of bacteria, um, rhizobia, and th and that provides an ability to. Um, fix nitrogen from the atmosphere. So they can take advantage of nitrogen in the atmosphere, whereas most plants don't get to do that, and so they have to rely on nitrogen that's already in the soils or in a fertilizer added. Um, and so that's, that's a more commonly known, but there's a ton, especially in the last um, decade or two, there's been a lot of progress in understanding additional groups of bacteria that just promote growth in plants, for, and there's different reasons where they do that, and so just trying to take advantage of those um, because you're going to bring bacteria with you anyway. And so one of the, uh, a really good way of defending plants against harmful bacteria can be beneficial bacteria right. and so it's a com in combination. And it can be a way to um, reduce the amount of fertilizer that you need. Hmm. Plus bacteria are really small. <laughs> <You can bring, laughs> they're a lot easier to bring with you than, <laughs> you know, so it just decreases the weight of what you need to bring with you. Right. I, mean, I was actually imagining, uh, you know, um, you know, when I was doing gardening the other day, you mm -hmm. know, with this, you know, big bag of bat guano fertilizing the garden, you know, I was thinking, hmm, you know, maybe bats don't weigh that much. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, and um, <laughs> no, they'll supply plenty of fertilizer. Um, <laughs> and can you tell us a little bit about your future explorations, where you are in your studies and, um, and what comes next mm -hmm. with what you're studying? So I'm actually finishing up pretty soon with um, my current my PhD, and so I'm um, everything but defense, so to speak. So I'm finishing up the last parts and um, writing out my dissertation. And so the next phase then is just focusing on, on what research I want to go forward in. <laughs> and that can include some of similar research. So just right now it's been very preliminary. There's been a lot of things that we've kind of explored surficially. We want to dive into more details on like specific aspects to really answer the questions that need to be answered to make that successful. So that's one option. But also just general um, interactions of um, the potential for life, like habitability and um, minerals and different geochemistry. And so that's my area of interest is I love the geochemistry and the geomicrobiology of things. And that's what I did in my master's. I did that on Earth. And so now I'm doing an aspect of that on Mars. So anything that continues in that general research, I'm interested in it. Fabulous. And just the last question, uh, what sort of, you talked about the questions that are still out there about how to grow crops on Mars. What are some of the biggest questions we still need to answer? Well, um, one of the things that my plants have been, is that they, um, there's some kind of toxicity they're responding to. I'm not, I have to specifically look at the results. I just got them back today, actually. <laughs> um, so we'll be able to see, but looking at some of the specific toxicity issues. And so I think there's some issues with availability of iron, especially on Mars. Or like you mentioned earlier, iron oxides in the soil. The plants are uptaking quite a bit of iron, the ones that I've seen so far, to the point where it maybe it's toxic. And so that could be a big concern. All right, all right. Well, that is great. Well, is it much of it? And is it more mobile? So right. I think those questions, that's a big one. That's great. That's great. Well, thank you so much for being yeah. on the show, Laura. It was great talking with you. Yeah, thanks for having me. <laughs> thank you. And that was Laura Fackrell from the University of Georgia. We'll be taking a week off from the show on November 17th, but we will be back November 24th. Make sure to join us then. Visit us each week on Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion as we bring space and astronomy news together with groundbreaking scientists directly to listeners and viewers around the world. We depend on support from viewers just like you. To help support this program with a one-time donation or a paid subscription starting at just 99 cents a month, please visit thecosmiccompanion.net forward slash support. Please stay safe, 
stay healthy, and keep your wonder alive. If you enjoyed this episode of Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion, please download and share the episode on YouTube, Facebook video, or on any major podcast provider. For more details on space and astronomy news, please visit thecosmiccompanion.com or thecosmiccompanion.net. 